The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the 16th chapter. And then Jesus told them a parable. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores, who longed to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table and even the dogs would come and lick his sores. This poor man died and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. Abraham replied, Child, Remember that in your lifetime you received good things, Lazarus in like manner evil things, and now he is comforted here, you are in torment there, and besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us, so that no one who wants to may pass from us to you, and no one can cross from there to us. The rich man said, then father, I beg you, send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, no, no. But if someone were to go to them from the dead, then they would repent. And Abraham replied, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe even if someone were to rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Praise you, Amen. Please be seated. I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we continue on our journey with Jesus down the road to Jerusalem and to the cross and the death that Jesus knows awaits him there. And we catch up with Jesus on page 851 in the Pew Bible, page 851 in the Pew Bible. It's Luke chapter 16 if you've brought your own Bible, and please do bring your own Bible to church so that you come ready to church, ready to go, and that you can make your Bible work to you. You can write in it, make notes in it, underline words and phrases, make it work for you. So it's Luke chapter 16 in the Bible, page 851 in the Pew Bible, and it's another parable about a rich man. Now, we heard one last week. Remember last week we heard the parable of the dishonest manager, which begins like this. There was a rich man who had a dishonest manager. Well, this parable begins, there was a rich man too. Last week, Jesus told the parable of the dishonest manager to the disciples. This week, he tells this parable to the Pharisees. Verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. And last week, the parable of the dishonest manager is easily the single most problematic and difficult parable in all of the Gospels. Well, this week's parable is not all that much easier. So let's take a look. Now, this parable, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, is a parable told in three scenes. And the first scene introduces the characters. Chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. So this rich man was dressed in purple and in fine linen. He, he was decked out like royalty, like a king. And he feasted sumptuously every day. And the word here in Greek for feasted sumptuously is a word that Jesus had just used in the parable of the prodigal son on the previous page where the same word is translated celebrate. Chapter 15, verse 23. Chapter 15, verse 23. And the father says, get the fattened calf and kill it. For let us eat and celebrate because this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And so they began to celebrate. Same word. So what the father does for his prodigal son upon his return, this rich man does for himself. Every day, he celebrates himself with a feast. So 
So that's the rich man. He's the one character. The other is a poor man who lays at his gate, verse 20. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to be satisfied with what fell from the rich man's table, and even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Now this man, Lazarus, is the only man, the one and only person with a name in any one of Jesus' parables. He's the only one. In his name, Lazarus, it means God helps. And I tell you what, it's a good thing that God helps because it's certain that nobody else will. Lazarus is the lowest of the low. He is the poorest of the poor. He is the most wretched of the wretched. Not just simply a beggar, but a crippled beggar who is laid at the gate of the rich man's house, covered with sore. And like the prodigal son who longs to be fed with the pods that the pigs eat, so Lazarus longs to satisfy his hunger with what falls, the table scraps that fall from the rich man's table. But he's got competition in the form of dogs. Now, these are not the cute and cuddly canines of a thousand Facebook posts. These are the mangy mutts of a million third world streets. These are scavengers. But they are his only companions. They are his competition for food. And to make matters worse, they even look upon him as an appetizer, licking his sores while they wait for their food. So those are the characters. You've got the rich man who stuffs himself every single day and the poor man, Lazarus, who lays starving at his very gate day in and day out. Those are the two characters. The first scene introduces them. The second one moves the action along. Verse 22. So the poor man died and was buried. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So death comes for both of these men, as death will come to us all. But their destinies could not be any different. Abraham is carried by the angels. Lazarus is carried by the angels to be with Abraham, feasting in the kingdom of heaven, while the rich man is in hell, being tormented by the flames. At the moment of death, there is a separation between Lazarus and the rich man, just as at the moment of death, there is a separation between the soul and the body. You see, God made us as a unity of body and soul. A unity of body and soul. These two things are united, and yet they are distinct from one another. Now, your body, you know what that is. That's your flesh, your blood, your ligaments, your cells, so on and so forth. Your soul, your soul is that part of you which is really and truly you. That part of you which is and remains identifiably you throughout all the passing of the years throughout all the drastic changes that your body goes through. From birth, to toddlerhood, to childhood, to adolescence, to prime of life, and then into old age. In the years of growth and in the years of decline, when you were small, when you were fully grown, and then when you start to shrink again. Throughout all the passing of the years, throughout all the drastic changes that your body goes through, yet there is something that remains the same, something that is really and truly you, and that something is your soul. Now death is when the soul is separated from the body. And if you've ever been at the bedside of somebody who has died, you know when that moment comes because the body is there. But the person is gone. The person is gone. Where have they gone to? The promise of Jesus is that those who belong to Jesus Go to be with him. That's his promise. He says that where I am, you may be with me also. They go to be with Jesus. That's the promise of Jesus. The Apostle Paul confirms it. When he says that when Jesus Christ comes again, he will bring with him 
those who have fallen asleep. They have fallen asleep, they are dead, and yet they are with Jesus in heaven. And so when Jesus comes again, Jesus will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And then later on, the Apostle Paul himself says that he would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And the Apostle John in his book of Revelation has a vision. He sees people from every tribe, every tongue, every language standing before the throne of God, standing before the Lamb. They are with Christ in heaven, though the general resurrection from the dead has not yet happened, though the end has not yet come, they are, yet they are with Jesus in heaven. The promise of Jesus is that those who belong to him go to be with him when they die. Those who do not belong to Jesus do not. Death is the separation of the soul from the body and death is the moment that separates the lost and the found, the redeemed and the damned, the wicked and the righteous. And that's what this scene is all about. With Lazarus in heaven while the rich man is in hell. And it leads us to the third scene, which consists of three exchanges between the rich man and Abraham. And in the first one, he basically says this, Yo, Abraham, send Lazarus my way now, would you? Verse 24, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus just to dip the very tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in torment here. Now note, the rich man recognizes Lazarus. He sees him far off, far away, and yet he knows who Lazarus is. He recognizes him. He even knows his name, Lazarus. And yet for all of that, the rich man still doesn't see Lazarus as someone equal to him, but only as someone beneath him, someone below him, someone who can be sent to do his bidding, certainly not his equal and definitely not his brother in the Lord, though Lazarus is at the side of the man that the rich man calls father. But he can't be Lord to me. And note also that though Abraham calls the rich man child, yet Abraham is not close to him, no, and never shall be. Verse 25, but Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, Lazarus in like manner evil things. Now he is comforted here, you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from us to you cannot, and nobody can cross from you to us. At the moment of death, there is a separation of the lost and the redeemed, and that separation is permanent. There is no crossing over from the one to the other, no passing over from the one to the other, no second chances, no hope of purgatory at all. It is permanent. And all of that, even though life is still going on up there on earth. Because remember, the rich man says, well, go and talk to my brothers, because his brothers are still alive and well. Life is still going on on earth. The end has not yet come, but the separation has already occurred, and the separation will be confirmed when the end comes. When Jesus Christ comes again, when the dead are raised and reunited with their bodies, to stand before him forever. That's why it's called the last judgment. It's not the only one, but it's the last one, the final one, the one that confirms everything that has gone before. And for this man, for this rich man, it is it's too late. But he figures, well, maybe it's not too late for my brothers. And so he says to Abraham a second time, if you can't send Lazarus to me, well, then why don't you send them to my brothers? Verse 27, he said, Then, Father, I beg you, I beg you to send them to my father's house, because I have five brothers, five brothers, that he might warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And you've got to see that this rich man's a little slow on the uptake, isn't he? Because for all of this, even after all that has happened to him, after all that Abraham has said, yet he still doesn't see Lazarus as his equal. He still sees Lazarus as someone beneath him, someone below him, someone who can be sent like a servant to go and do his bidding. And Abraham replies, verse 29, listen, they have Moses and the prophets. 
They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Moses and the prophets, that's shorthand for the Old Testament. It's shorthand for the word of God. And so Abraham is saying, listen, they've got the word of God. Let them read the word of God. Let them listen to the word of God. Let them listen to Moses, who commands them to care for the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner at your gate. Let them read the prophets and listen to the prophets who thunder tirades against those who turn a blind eye to the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner at your gates. Let them read God's word because you cannot read God's word and claim not to know God's will or what will happen if you live contrary to it, says Abraham. And you see, that's exactly the problem. That's the problem because this rich man knows his brothers all too well. He knows that they don't listen to the word of God. He knows that they won't listen to the word of God. And so almost in desperation, he tries a third time saying, well, Abraham, if you're not going to send Lazarus to me, if you can't send him to my brothers, well, at least try to scare him straight for me, would you? Verse 30, he said to them, no, Father Abraham, they're not going to listen, no. But if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. I'd scare them straight. It's like in a Christmas carol. Remember that? When the ghost of Jacob Marley appears to Ebenezer Scrooge at night, warns him of what will happen and scares some sense into that miserly old man. And that's what the rich man is saying. He's saying, you got to do the same thing to my brother. Send Lazarus to grab him by the scruff of the neck and scare some sense into him. And Abraham says, no, no. Verse 31, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither shall they be convinced, even if someone were to rise from the dead. Now remember that a parable is a story with a point, and that's the point of the parable right there. Remember who Jesus is telling the story to, the Pharisees, who are lovers of money, teachers of the law, and adversaries of Jesus Christ. Time and time and time again, they demand of Jesus that he work some sign to prove to them that he really is who he claimed to be. And had they not heard Jesus teach the law as no one had ever taught it before, did they themselves not say, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? Had they not seen Jesus perform sign after sign, wonder after wonder, miracle after miracle, healing the sick, making the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to leap. Had they not seen Jesus cast out demons by the dozens and redeem those who had been held captive by the grip of Satan? And just a few days from this very point, when at last Jesus has walked that road all the way to Jerusalem, would they not see the very thing the rich man asks for, namely that another Lazarus would be raised from the dead? And did they believe in Jesus then? No because they did not want to. They had eyes but refused to see. They had ears but refused to hear because their heart was hardened against him. They did not want to see. They did not want to hear. They did not want to turn to God. And so they were lost. Already judged by the parable. As surely as this rich man was judged in the parable, let me ask you this. Why is the rich man in hell and Lazarus in heaven? Is it because the one is rich and the other is poor? When did Jesus ever teach? When did Jesus ever teach that wealth damns and poverty saves? If that were the case, Jesus wouldn't have to come and take away our sin. He could just come and take away our money. If that were the case, Abraham would not be in heaven with Lazarus at his side because Abraham was a rich man too, the wealthiest man of his generation, and yet Abraham was in heaven because Abraham used his wealth to bless others, rolling out the red carpet for those three angel visitors and throwing them a feast, making friends for himself by means of his wealth, as we heard in the parable last week. But this man, the rich man, he did nothing. You see, it's not that he did the wrong things. It's not like he was, you know, having Lazarus forcibly removed from off his property, or he'd mock Lazarus, or curse Lazarus, or, or kick Lazarus in the ribs, or, 
or refuse to give Lazarus any sort of table scraps whatsoever. It's not that he was doing the wrong kind of things that would get him thrown into jail. It's that he didn't do the right thing. He didn't do the right thing, and that's what landed him into hell. And you know what the right thing is. Love your neighbor. And Lazarus was his neighbor, his closest neighbor, right there at his very doorstep. The rich man saw him every day. Every time he went in and out, he saw him, he knew him, he recognized him, he called him by name, and yet for all that, he did nothing to help him because he didn't want to. He had eyes, but refused to see Lazarus as someone worthy of help. He had ears but refused to hear God's word or keep it. He had money, but refused to spend it on anyone other than himself because his heart was hardened. And so he would not turn to God and he was lost. In that life and in the age to come, he was lost. Now this parable, it's called the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, but I tell you what, it's really not about Lazarus at all. Lazarus is a, a secondary character at best. The rich man talks, Abraham talks, Lazarus doesn't get to say a word because it's not about him. It's about the rich man and his brothers who are dead to God and deaf to the world. And this parable could just as well be called the parable of the six brothers. And let me ask you, are you one of them? You know what God says in his word. You know what God wants you to do. You know who God wants you to help. You know the Lazarus who is lying in your life. It's not hard to figure out. But like those brothers, have you hardened your heart against him? Do you have eyes and yet refuse to see, ears and yet refuse to hear, resources and yet refuse to use them because you do not want to do them? You do not want to use them. You have hardened your heart against him. One of the greatest tragedies that can ever happen to a person is to hear the word of God and to ignore it. And so do not ever say to yourself, well, I'd believe if only Jesus would give me a sign, because I tell you what, he has given you a sign. He has given you the greatest sign of his all. God has given you his son. His son, Jesus, who was born as a man for you. His son, Jesus, who lived and taught for you. His son, Jesus, who went to the cross for you. His son, Jesus, who died for you. His son, Jesus, who rose from the dead for you. Hallelujah, Jesus lives and Jesus is speaking his word to you today. Do not despise it. Do not ignore it. Do not plug your ears to it. Do not harden your heart against it. Do not turn away from it because I tell you what, his word is truth and his word is power. His word has the power to change your life. His word has the power to create faith where there is none. His word has the power to soften hearts. And he is speaking his word to you today. Do not ignore him. But let the Holy Spirit in. Let the Holy Spirit do his work, and the Holy Spirit will change you. Change you from within to give you the eyes to see Lazarus in your life, to give you the hands to give Lazarus a helping hand so that in the age to come you can spend eternity in heaven with Lazarus and Jesus. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you through the word today. Listen. Listen. And let him in. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is truth. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is power. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you speak to us through your word. Lord, sometimes your word comforts us, and other times, God, it convicts us. Lord, no matter what you say to us, give us the ears to hear. Give us the heart to receive it. 
Lord, claim us as your own and change us that we might be yours now and forever. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you would please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And together we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord.